When you talk about I identity politics, define what that means for us. Sure. What I mean is the division of the country, the reimagining of America as a country, a confederation of uh, categories based on race, sex, uh, national background, uh, gender, uh, gender identity, race, uh, uh, sexual preference, anything that bestows uh, a degree of victimhood on the members of the categories, victimhood that which they can then use to claim uh, respect or attention or compensatory justice, uh, but not as individuals, as members of the category. And, and tell us why, tell us about the, the word plot, the plot to divide the land of the free. Um, when did you see this plot beginning and who's behind it? Well, it's not, uh, it's not that you have meetings uh, in, in basements in Madison, Wisconsin or Cambridge, Massachusetts on Thursday nights. Is this idea of using the category as a way to change America, as a way to, to transform America into something else, into it, it systemically change it? Uh, not, uh, it, it is a, a, uh, a rejection of the individual, improving uh, himself or herself and their family and accessing the American dream, because that is joining the system. The idea here is to change the system and to tear it down. And that is really at the core of identity politics and critical race theory and all the other philosophies and disciplines. And that is why it is a it is really a, a plot in the sense that the people who propose this, the proponents, do quite openly admit to wanting to change America structurally and systemically. One of the uh, the pieces in your your new book talks about the myths of identity politics. You write that identity politics is not is a is a, a, and the myth is that it is a grassroots movement, that it is politics responding to the demographic shifts in the country, or that it's uh, fighting identity politics is not only a quote depraved but futile uh, effort. Tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. And that is why uh, one of the reasons why it needs to be called out. And the reason I wrote my book, The Plot to Change America, was to expose these myths. Uh, this they, they, One of the reasons why it succeeds is that it hijacks one of our best impulses as humans. And that is the impulse to be compassionate, to side with, with the, the, the people who need our help. However, these ideas were not, uh, did not come from the, the grassroots. In fact, the grassroots were very open. We can go into this later, that they rejected uh, being seen as marginalized or as members of minorities or as victims. Uh, they wanted to, to, to access the American dream individually through their own agency. Uh, these are people who were oftentimes, who, who were aware that they were discriminated against, and yet they believed that they could improve their lot in life individually. The idea that, no, you act through the collective is imposed by ideologues and activists who have this idea of changing America in mind. So I think it's one of the most important things to call out right away and say we should be very aware that our best impulses are being hijacked here. The other one is this idea of demography, that a change in demography after the Hart Seller Act, that the, the new immigration law in 1965 necessitated this division of the country into groups. That is not the case. America's uh, demograph the demography has been changing uh, since the 1600s. Actually, uh, the, ad the, the the advent of the the the, the, the arrival of, of, of Germans and then Scots Irish, and then in the 1850s of Scandinavians and new Germans. It's about seven million of them from 1850 on, and the Irish because of the potato famines. And then you have Ellis Island, a, a profusion of groups from Armenia and Syria and Sicily and Eastern Europe and Hungary. Um, so America's demography has always been changing. There was nothing about this new wave, which is just a continuation of the American story that necessitated uh, breaking the country into categories and, and minorities. As we started the program, I mentioned briefly your, some of your professional background, but um, two things. Tell us a little bit about your immigration background coming to this country, your folks. And secondly, in the things you were just talking about, there used to be the idea of a melting pot in America. Is that does that still exist, or is that idea still worth having? Well, let me take that one uh, first. Yeah. Uh, yes, the melting pot is one of the first uh, ideas that is targeted in this new dispensation of identity politics um, and for a reason, because the melting pot 
It's about joining the system and, and improving the system and accessing the system. And the people who have this in mind do not want to improve the system. They want to change the American system, starting with capitalism. These are very Marxist ideas. Uh, critical theory on which all of this is based is, is a neo-Marxist school. Um, my own history is one... I, I, I am an immigrant. I, uh, I, I was born in Cuba, left at the age of 12. Uh, we, my family went to Europe. Then we came here to New York in the early 70s when I had just turned 14. Um, I have been able to, then I, I, I have this history. If you want to use the, the language of the left, it is my lived experience uh, to, to understand certain things. But then I, as I, you mentioned that I was a journalist. I was a foreign correspondent. Uh, I was abroad for 15 years, spending the bulk of that in Asia and Europe, uh, with it's in some reporting in Latin America as well. But the vast majority of the time was spent in Asia and Europe. So I, I am able to compare and contrast. I'm able to to see, to 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 compare different models. And I I believe in America. I believe in the American system. I think this is not a fantastic country, not just because of. The, the, the opportunity gave my family uh, to escape uh, the harsh realities of communism and socialism, but also because it has produced a level of, uh, of, of, of liberty and prosperity unheard of in the history of mankind.